So, I teach 7th and 8th grade American history, 12th grade civics at the college level, 12th grade health class, and this year a logic 1 class. I used to be the lunch lady and janitor. This year I've given up both of those jobs. I'm just a straight teacher now. I also do PE, pre-K through 6th grade, which is very interesting and fun. So, over to progress. Students with the grammar school and logic school and our expectations will increase. The 7th and 8th grade years are really kind of the formative years, getting the baby fat off them. So they go from their hand being held, kind of escorted through each step of the way. And 7th and 8th grade year, we'll, we'll begin giving them more stuff, but we really begin to ramp up the, uh, the expectations. There's a pretty steep learning curve for 7th and 8th grade, a lot of students struggle initially, but that's okay. You, know, you kind of expect that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Sources. So, primarily there are three types of sources you will come across. Primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary sources are immediate, first-hand kind of top from people who had a direct connection with it. Example include government reports, symposia, conference proceedings, original artwork, poems, photographs, speeches, letters, memos, personal narratives, diaries, interviews, autobiographies, and correspondence. Generally, but not always, primary sources are what we want our students to use. That's very classical. Get your hands on the primary source. We're going to talk about Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Well, let's read them directly. Talk about art, look at the artwork directly. Now, primary sources aren't always reliable. We'll get that in a minute. But by and large, you generally want to try and go to the first hand sources. Even when they're not accurate or lying, even, they can still be useful. Second is secondary sources. Secondary sources are at least one step removed from the event or phenomenon under review. These materials interpret, assign value to, conjecture upon, draw conclusions about the events reported in primary sources. They're usually in the form of published works, such as journal, articles, or books, but may include radio or television documentary or comics proceedings. So secondary sources would be something like this. I have a good book on Stonewall Jackson. It's a secondary source. I also have Off the Union Diary of Elijah Hunt Rhodes. This would be a primary source. So there's clearly something different between the primary and secondary source. Um, your secondary sources will be your scholarly work, you know, compendium of stuff, things that are kind of gathered together for you. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Ah, I talk fast. <laughs> Tertiary sources. They are indexes, abstract, organized, compile, or digest other sources. Some reference material textbook are in part of this category, as their main purpose is to list, summarize, or simply repackage ideas slash information. Tertiary sources are usually not credited to a particular author. Examples include dictionaries, encyclopedias, almanac, factbooks, Wikipedia, bibliographies, directories, guidebooks, manuals, handbooks, textbooks, indexing, abstract sources. Now, secondary and tertiary sources can exist at the same time. Most textbooks are both, are in both a secondary and tertiary source. Generally, as a rule of thumb, I have no problem with seventh and eighth graders having a tertiary source, like a World War II fact book I have that has like what type of guns they use, what troop movements were. As we advance, we want a little bit more than a tertiary source, because generally they're just, they don't give a lot of context. But tertiary sources can be very good for getting just raw data. For example, World War uh, II, the United States Army used the M1 Grand for a 30 6 round. You know, a almanac will tell you that, how many guns we make. Very useful, but it's a lot of context. But they're still useful. Now, what makes a good source? Determining what is not a trustworthy source of information is very tricky. Even trusted sources can be fraudulent or be wrong. Generally, the best sources are peer reviewed or primary. Well respected authors can make X sources as well. Traditionally, if we treated with KR views, then the source will information and prove that they arrive in a study wrong, they very misleading. Now, I'm sure all of you guys see the news. The news today is extremely biased. If you walk away and watch MSNBC, Donald Porter, President Trump, is the devil in crime. Now, the reverse of that is if you watch Fox News, Joe Biden's the devil incarnate, and Trump's aunt, you know, is, is second coming. So you have to be very careful with traditional media sources. I don't tell them they can't cite them, but be very careful, because generally, with MSNBC and Fox particularly, if they're going to have a study, it's probably going to come out favoring their political agenda. 
Do you have someone suspect with it? Not always wrong, be very careful with them. Um, so, I'll get to it in a second. So, example of problematic source, so two examples we're going to talk about. But who knows who Rodic this is? You, kind of like the classic Greek historian, right? Yeah, he's father of history, yeah. The author of Julius Caesar. Famous for the salad and trying to declare himself a god. And he actually did had try to have himself declared a god during his lifetime. It was a way to escape his debts. Kind of fun story. But anyways, Julius Caesar and Herodotus. Herodotus wrote the histories that covered the Greco-Persian Wars. And Julius Caesar wrote, uh, wrote the Gallic Wars, which we read here at Trinity Academy. Both sources are utterly invaluable for today's modern stories. I mean, they really teach us what happened back then. However, Herodotus claimed the Persian army was over a million, and Caesar claimed the Gauls were over a million. That would been impossible. Even today, we struggle to feel that kind of army. So, and they knew they were lying. Caesar was a very confident general. He knew he was lying. Caesar spent his entire life in debt. Caesar was trying to sell books back in Rome and generate propaganda and have himself declare dictator for life. So Caesar had a clear agenda when he was writing the book, and Herodotus openly says history should be entertaining and fun. So that doesn't mean you can't use these sources. So for example, if a seventh grader were to quote Herodotus and say the Greeks fought a million Persians, I would say, okay, Herodotus was lying and kind of the history behind that. With the high school students, you kind of expect them to go a little deeper in digging and find out that those numbers are, are false, because uh, act, uh, numbers of minor strains are closer to 100,000 on both sides. So yeah, with both of them, because you only kind of expect them. Now, I give the example of primary news source. You guys heard Fox News lost the data payout? You guys hear about that? So Fox News uh, had to pay out 725, uh, sorry, $787.5 million to Dominion, to Dominion voting for no election 2020 election laws being fraudulent. So what happened there was, was news media can say, for example, President Biden is an evil, evil, dumb man. And that's fine, right? That, that, that's it's freedom of speech. Now, if you say President Biden is killing people, now you cream into a claim. Fox News openly saying election was stolen, and Dominion News sued them, and it was revealed in discovery that uh, both Tucker Carlson and, um, what's the owner's name? Ralph something or other. But anyways, it came out that none of the Fox News actually election was stolen. What happened was in Arizona, local Fox News began covering the election was stolen. It wasn't stolen, sorry. So viewership began to decline, so the Fox News actually made a decision to cover the election was stolen, even, uh, even though that was proven uh, definitely false later. And they did that for viewership, because the viewers wanted to hear that narrative. But under a testimony, every single Fox executive admitted it was not stolen. They never believed it was stolen, and they didn't the viewers wanted to see it. So again, if you had cited that as a student, Fox News claimed election was stolen, well, egg on your face later on, the executives all admitted they knew it wasn't. So you be very careful with traditional media sources. Um, recently in Stanford, one of their deans, had you heard about that with Dean's story in Stanford? Uh, is this the one about um, falsifying data? Yeah, so one of the top neuroscientists at Stanford had to resign because it turns out he may have lied or directly altered data on very well respected uh, neuro, neuroscience reports. So even the top levels of academia, you have to be skeptical, have some degree of skepticism of. So, yes. Now, coming to this research. At the 7th and 8th grade level, teachers generally will provide guidance to students to help with the source selection. Once they reach traditional high school years, and at 12th grade years, they are expected to know how to source on their own. So, generally, some infant years, I will give them materials to use. I'll help them out. Because, again, they're new at handling the materials. So, me, Ms. Spangler, or uh, Mr. Murray will generally give them sources. Like, for example, we do a co paper on Light and Forest based on Delaware Indians. And the Delaware Indians actually have a website. Now, I'm actually, my grandpa's a car carrying member of the, of the Cherokee Nation. I'm Delaware Indian by blood. And the Delaware Indians adopt, or sorry, the Cherokee adopted Delaware. I have a close personal family ties to the Delaware tribe because I have family who live out there on the reservation. So we'll give them sources. They have a website they use, a very useful website, that has pretty sure it's oral history. So we'll give, we'll give them sources to use. Once they're at the high school level, we kind of step back and expect them to kind of know and pull sources. 
But we expect mistakes, and that's okay. Mistakes are just fine, as long as they learn from them. Now, with me and YouTube, I tell students, if you don't know where to start on Wikipedia, you can't cite it as a source. But if you're curious, like, say you're doing World War II, don't know where to start, go on Wikipedia. Go on YouTube. You'll get your feet wet. With younger students, I caution that more, because they're more likely to be the first thing they hear or read that I think is true. Do you care with the younger students? With the older students, I tend to say, yeah, for Wikipedia, just start there. Uh, YouTube has some great lectures on it. You can cite a lecture on YouTube. Uh, Professor Gary Gallagher, one of the most respected, you know, historians today, you can cite him on uh, YouTube. Now, citations. At Trinity Academy, we use the Chicago style citation. Uh, the style is most commonly used in social sciences, social science history. I have used Chicago citation for many years, I have published with it. It's not hard. The main distinguishing feature of the Chicago style citation is this. So you see in the bottom of this book here, you have footnotes at the bottom of it. That is the tall tale sign of the Chicago citation. Now, not you don't always have to put the Chicago style citation in this format. You don't have to put it at the bottom of foot, the uh, footnotes. Some students have realized, let's say you have a five page uh, required paper. Well, what some of the more clever ones will do is they'll fill it up this much full of citations, anecdotes in there, and get five pages out of like 500 words. So I had it the first year I made that mistake. I uh, my mistake, some of my more clever students figured out almost immediately you could do that. I had a five page paper and one had like a thousand words, which is like two, two and a half, three pages for five pages. So, my fault. Learn lesson on that one. Kids are very clever. If they can find a way to cheat the system, they will. So, yes, um, that's how Tale Science Chicago Citation it is it's, uh, you have the number in and out. So, do you ever use citation generators? By the way, he's a professor at Western in math. Yeah, I know. No, I haven't. So, again, I'm going to show it to you, but my phone is fighting me. So, will you let me do it? No, okay. Citation generators exist. I have used them. I do not tell students about them. And the reason why is, is because citation, what does it, pulls the information from the website directly. Depending on how it's designed, it could put you in a bad spot. It could screw up. I uh, one had a paper I did, had about 30 citations on it. Spent about a day fixing it because the generator screwed them all up, got them all wrong, jumbled them. So I do not say you can't use them, but I use extreme caution when using them because they can mess you up. But I don't tell them about them, but we don't outright say you can't use them, just be careful with them. But they do exist, they are out there. I've used them before, so I won't tell you you can't use them, but be careful with telling your students to use them, because they can be wrong. Only citation. So, the rule of thumb is, and this can vary with, especially at the academic level, things not common knowledge. So, for example, according to the Congressional uh, Budget Office, in 2022, the government collected $4.9 trillion in revenue, where it spent $6.3 trillion. Uh, Therefore, the U.S. government had a spending deficit of $1.4 trillion. Now, I, what I had to cite was for the numbers. The fact that the government uh, spends revenue had a deficit, that one I wouldn't be, I'd be fine with in common knowledge. You assume the government has to function at some level. So if I said uh, every year Congress spends money, I wouldn't even cite that. The numbers, yes, you would. So things like dates, Name, so for example, uh, George Washington was the uh, first president. Don't have to cite that. That's common knowledge. George Washington, vice president, was Thomas Jefferson. Again, don't even cite that. that. That's common knowledge. If you say George Washington owned so many slaves, that one you need to source on. That's a very specific claim, that being general knowledge. It, there's a bit of a gray area there, but generally I've had too much of an issue with it. Any questions so far? And it's pretty straightforward and clinical. But, but yeah, okay. Handbook. Oh, God. I actually want you guys to go through this one with me. Well, I guess not. So 
here at Trinity Academy, we do have a handbook. I highly, highly recommend if you get a chance, if your student is in the high school, to go through it. Because it will walk through everything. Chicago style citation is not a one fits all. The way you cite an article, a conference, a book are slightly different. They require slightly different things. I've had a couple professors in my college get my master's degree who were pretty big sticklers on um, what you could, could not use. Every room will have one of these in them. It may not be what makes good for your student. An official Chicago is actually good for grammar, it's good for pretty much everything. Every year it's updated, especially as new and new sources come into play. So yeah, we do have a handbook. Again, I apologize, my computer is defying me. Technology is evil, today at least, but yes. Now, plagiarism. Plagiarism defines the fact of taking someone else's work or ideas and pass them off as one's own. At Trinity Academy, any student caught plagiarizing will result in an automatic zero the assignment must have, uh, on the assignment that got that on there and must have a sit down with the administrator, student's parents, and the teacher. Now, plagiarism, I haven't come across it here yet strictly. What I'll find most students tend to do is though, they'll tend to overquote, like half their paper will be famous with quotations. Not a form of plagiarism per se, because you're giving them credit, but it's not writing a paper either. Uh, I've had a little cheating, have caught some cheating, that has happened, I won't lie, it hasn't happened. Uh, that's been addressed. But I do also warn my students, so, so, Professor, at Western, if you catch student cheating, what's the process of uh, how that work at Western? So, uh, you have to file an academic integrity report yes. that gives the uh, documentation as to why you say they have cheated. Uh, they can, there's an appeal process, and it can go up the chain, but that's how it works. Yeah, yeah it's plagiarism at the FW is extremely serious. Um, genuinely, you're better off failing the class than having it against you on your academic record for plagiarism. For It'll go on your transcript. It will go, and that can, for some college, outright bar you. I mean, genuinely, fail the class, quit the class, block the assignment, do not get caught cheating, especially at the college level, it is so, so serious. I knew a um, student, a friend of mine, she did it, and she got caught right away because she had three solid citations, MLA, ABA, Chicago on one paragraph, which is kind of a dead giveaway. She was copying and pasting different sections. But to stress our students very heavily, here it's really bad. At college, it can potentially cripple your academic career, potentially if you're caught. Now, we're having an open discussion now on chat GPT head up. Anyone here not familiar with ChatGPT is? So, ChatGPT is an AI, artificial intelligence. I can go in there and type into it, ChatGPT, what is the current president? They'll tell you that. ChatGPT, who would win in a fight, Superman or Thor? I'll give you an answer. Um, ChatGPT is not writing books. It is, so you guys know there's that uh, writer's strike going on in Hollywood right now? Yeah. Hear about that? Uh, this will probably be the last writer's strike you've ever seen. Yeah. And they're fighting for everything. The reason why is this. Bruce Willis, you guys all know him, got dementia. You know, Phasia, really, I loved him. His career's done. However, his likeness and image, can a studio make an AI CGI him and use him forevermore on? Does Bruce Willis and his estate now own his face and characters? Or a studio own them forevermore? We don't know. Uh, you know, Luke Skywalker, Mark Hamill, Darth Vader, uh, actors and actresses, Morgan Freeman, Tom Cruise in Mission, or James Bond, the James Bonds. Do though are actors or writers entitled to make money off their work going forward? We don't know. This is just me, the Trinity Academy. I believe in 50, 20 to 50 years, TV shows will be gone. You pay for subscription service and you make your own TV show. Charlie Chaplin, Bruce Willis, Adolf Hitler, and Tom Cruise, all starring as the uh, Four Musketeers. And they'll make it for you. They'll CGI it for you. Movies, TV shows, books. Uh, here at Trinity Academy, Lord of the Rings. 
Tolkien is an objectively great author. He created modern fantasy. It's only a matter of time before AI can isolate what made Tolkien great and make it better. It, it is scary. So at college, so how do you handle ChatGPT? Because I don't know. What, I don't know what to do. I don't it, know. It is not affecting me, but I've heard stories. Um, you know, for example, an, an English professor, um, not at our university, but at another university, um, uh, put in various criteria. Had Chat GPT write a journal article. It went through a peer review process and got accepted. Yeah. So talking about plagiarism, I mean, this is, and and in the, even in the computer science department, it can write programs. So yeah. so like they, they have an assignment where they're asked to you know write some program that'll do some sort of thing. Uh, Chat GPT can write uh, programs, and um, from what I hear, you know you can. It, it sounds, when, when, when you get something out of chat GPT, it's very professional. When you start to think deeply about it, then, then you can maybe start to see its flaws. It, it, it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's AI, it's not a person actually thinking. Right. But on the surface, um, it can seem very passable, basically to do anything. Yeah, it's, I genuinely, um, at the college level, I, 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 I actually work with Spoon River. I don't know what I'm going to do. Because, um, for example, people who check the essays run through a quiz room checker, have to find colors. It's actually learned now to purposely insert grammar mistakes. So, one thing I'll look for for a thing if your grammar is perfect, first of all, kid, you're not perfect grammar. You are not that good. So, if you're ever going to write away, the kids probably did something, you know, use grammar or something, which I don't like a grammar per se. But ChatGPT, it'll purposely build in grammar mistakes. So, yeah, oh, I give up 15 minutes of any, any thoughts on that? Because it's it's coming. It's it's not going away. Sounds like it's already here. It, it is, and you know, it's only getting better. I don't, I don't know how you stop it. I, I don't either. I probably you know already they're writing books, authors writing books of ChatGPT and other similar things. You know, I think it's pro think about uh, I think it probably takes what AI less than a minute to write, write a 400 page book. Well, it can do that 10,000 times a day. It's going to work faster than you ever could. So, I think, I mean, in, in some sense, um, uh, what Trinity Academy is doing is the, I think, the best way to fight it, which is uh, let's actually care about yes. uh, thinking yes. and let's care about old things, you know, you know, you know, part, part of I think that a war of chat GPT is, you know, it can it's it can just kind of create things that are new. But if we really actually deeply care about things that are classical and older and actually have some timeless value, that's at least a um, we can instill in our children that this isn't that great. Um, because if you don't think that this is that great, then maybe you have a chance of uh, you know, hearing about your own uh, thought process. That sort of, yeah. No, all of history, genuinely, um, with history, my biggest concern is two things. One, they walk away better writers, right? Two, love history. Genuinely, as much as I cover, they're going to probably forget most of it. I accept that. But you know what? If they walk away, you know what, Mom? I'm going to watch you documentary. I want to read a history book. I will. Genuinely, my class, I want them to walk away liking history. It really is, you know, and be better writers. And you know, with writing, it's time. You know, writing, either you're born, like man, either you're born good at it, or you practice, 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 practice. You know, in my class, uh, 75 percent results in automatic reading, and I do that intentionally because I think these formative years you need to build their confidence, self esteem up. So as long as they're trying in good faith and they give me a utterly bad paper, okay, no, 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 let's go through here. Let's learn from it. Let's make it a positive experience. Because genuinely, if you have a student who makes a mistake but learns from it, oh, thanks, Mr. Adams, I can correct that. That's the war. The war is won. They'll keep learning, they'll keep, they're not afraid, they're not afraid uh, to do better. 
I actually purposely have two handouts I give. They are purposely messed up. And I do that to so your students, I made a mistake. Here, I'll fix it. To show them, you know, I made a mistake. I said it was okay. I owned it, I fixed it. I hope it makes an impact on them. Because, you know, if, if I can't make a mistake and I can't admit to it, why should they? If I can't admit I was wrong, I can't correct my mistakes, why should I have to? So I really make it a point to, if I make a mistake, own it and, you know, correct it. So they didn't see that. One, one, one thing that I just thought of that I, I think that is one of the ways to fight this AI stuff is exactly what we were talking about with primary sources. That there is actually enjoyment to go find, you know, an old diary of, say, Stonewall Jackson and actually look at it and read it and see what uh, he, he wrote. And if, if, if we can encourage our students that, that that's actually really cool, that's really enjoyable and fun, um, then writing something with AI starts to lose its allure. Um, because, I mean, it's completely false. <laughs> it's just completely false. So yes, this is the Chicago Style Handbook. Um, what grade are your students in? Okay, perfect. So, I will be going over this with them. I will. Um, I will try and print out for them if I can. So formatting. It's supposed to be uh, Times Roman 12 point font. If they use Arial, I'm not going to complain. It's most 12 point font, but if they use Arial, which is the other common one, I'm, I'm not going to make a deal out of it. Um, double uh, space text, one inch margin, half inch indents, and place page number top right, bottom center. We will cover this with them in class, how to do all this, and it's just a matter of learning how to do it. So all in class, we'll take a point and cover that with them. Uh, they'll have a title page. Well, Generally, we will include a title page. More professional looking, I find, have that title page. Gives more professional. Generally, they'll have one. And here, it will have center of the line, double space, should appear one third down the page, headline calculation of the bold. And we stress that because attention to fine detail, the more you pay to that, the more you pay to other things. So if you pay attention to the margins, the font, the indentation, you're more likely to pay attention to your grammar, you know, your details. So really strive for details. Because that's what really makes a great paper. So, an example of what a title page looks like you have Jane Smith, student number, we had one, student literature, course number, June. That would be for an academic, more of an academic uh, setting. Full note. So, at the bottom of the page, in those index citations, you have two options with it. When you initially cite the source for the first time, you put the bottom, you're required to do a long full note bottom of the page. That's the first time you cite it. For subsequent citations will be short it uh, which will repeat the same source. So the second citation is shorter. And that's you know just for easier convenience. So yeah, that's how we expect the initial one now again. Miss Spangler generally requires a page length. I generally do uh, word count. And I do that because students will try and kind of game the system a little bit. So you got you have a thousand citations, I don't care. It has to be five hundred words. So oversight won't do any favors, but that's just a me thing. So um, books, the most common source they will come across is you have the number, author's first and last name, title. Now the title of the book is always going to be italicized, slanted, uh, place publication, publisher name, date publication, and date. Now, it is okay to be confused by this. I have published with stress citation. Even I will sometimes have to consult the guidebook again or a source because I'll forget. So it is okay to use this. I recommend using it. I encourage using it. It'll take a while. It'll eventually become second nature to you. Just give it time. You know, give it time. Um, you know, one thing I tell parents is as your kid gets older, it may become hard off with certain subjects. So math. I am terrible at math. I have study halls. Students ask me to help in math. I am powerless to help them. I, I can't help them. I, I'm not going to admit. If I'm not reading the book they're reading, I might not be able to help them very much. As much as I want, I don't know the book. And you know, parents, you guys might not always do the same book we read. You know, you may not be, uh, be familiar with what we're doing. But 
But, 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 and this is essential, you can check their sources. So in history, I gave an example of two papers. The first paper is beautiful. It makes you love again. It makes you reach out and connect the long lost family. You adopt a dozen puppies. But it's factually inaccurate and the sources are wrong. Second paper makes you throw up. It is bad. It makes you lament the decline of Western civilization and question your place in the universe. But it is factually correct and well sourced. Of the two papers, the second paper may have a low grade, but it will have a higher grade than the first paper. Because in a history of social science paper, this way math too, I'm sure, if you are wrong on your primary source and your basic facts, you can't be a history paper. I don't care if Shakespeare wrote it. If Shakespeare has your paper and Shakespeare has the wrong facts and sources, it is a bad paper. It can't even be looked at. So, with your students, if history and social science papers, you can always check this. Is it well sourced? Are the sources trustworthy? Are they cited right? Doesn't matter what age you are, that's what you can always check with them on. So, yes, yeah, kind of keep that in mind. Okay, any questions? I know that was quick, pretty clinical, but in any questions, any thoughts, concerns, or comments, please. So all that can be looked up on the any yes. resource. Yes, and I promise you, at some point, there will be new citation, just consult this. It's your best friend. It really, really is. Because even if I was to write a publisher again, I have to use it. Because Chicago, you know, how you cite a book, how you quote a professor in a lecture, how you cite a video, let's say you um, have a great YouTube video you want to quote, which that's valid, you have a, a direct primary source lecture, that's a great, great source to use. Got to cite differently. And now again, as they get older, we'll become more and more strict on the accuracy of the source once they're cited. So yes. Thank you so much for listening to that. That's what I had. I, I had more time. I thought I did. I'm sorry. I promise you. <laughs>